welcome to Penguin at Home. This is a weekly live series in which writers invite you into their home and tell you about the things that are bringing them comfort in this in this very strange time. Uh, so welcome to my home, not my home. I'll explain that in a minute. The first thing that I just want to confess, and I just, I'll feel much better once it's off my shoulders, because otherwise I think it can be very awkward for everyone. I was quite nervous about doing this, particularly the old webcam lighting situation, um, which isn't famously forgiving. So I may or may not have um, <laughs> quite rashly bought a ring light, which is these lights that, that the very gorgeous beauty vloggers have like with their camera suspended on um, and it was meant to arrive yesterday and it hasn't arrived and I've just got a message saying it's going to be probably delivered within the next half hour and um, so if there's a knock on the door I've put a sign on the door it's my ring light that was going to make me look like Rosie Huntington Whiteley um, and sadly arrived too late and I now have absolutely no, no use for. Um, so there we go. Hello, I'm Dolly Alderton. I'm the author of the memoir, Everything I Know About Love, and an upcoming novel called Ghosts, which is out in October. I'm a Jed columnist for the Sunday Time Style, and I co-host the High Low every week with Pandora Spikes. Um, right, so my home that I'm in now, sitting on the floor, where there's the, near the router, um, this is a cottage in Devon that, that I don't live in. I came here to finish my novel in early mid-March and then the world fell apart. So I kind of got accidentally marooned here um, and I've been here ever since. So it's very strange. I'm a, I'm a London dwelling girl. I've always kind of lived in London or the suburbs of London. And now I'm living in the countryside. This is the longest I've ever, I've ever been away from the, from the city. Um, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm just getting to that point now, I'm trying to work out whether it's kind of changed me in any real, real way. The main thing that I'm very, very proud of is that I now can actually make a fire because the first week that I was here, I had very loose grasp on how you make a fire. Because I basically thought when you get a pack of fire lighters, I thought that that you basically go through sort of like a pack a week. I didn't realize that they were meant to last like a year. So I just wasn't really building the fire, put a match in, then I just sort of chuck the fire lighters in almost like a fireworks display. And I just think how amazing and roaring this fire is. Anyway, I've learned how to build a fire and the key is you have to tie your newspapers in knots. Um, so that's my kind of first big change that I think has happened to me. Um, and the other, look, I've got logs. Can you believe that? I'm a person who has logs. Um, and the other big thing that's that's changed me is I'm now one of those people, but I don't know if this is the countryside or whether it's just that I'm desperate for human interaction. I've now become one of those people who gets genuinely excited when I'm on a walk, when I see someone in the horizon and I see them with a dog coming towards me and I just start sweating about saying hello to them. And I want to get the hello in first. Really, it's the highlight of my day. <laughs> Um, so my comforts that I have been relying on since I've been here. Um, first of all, I need to tell you all about a life changing recipe, which is the Marcella Hazan tomato sauce, because it's so, so good. I'm annoyed that it's taken this long for me to find it, but it's perfect for, for lockdown living because it only requires three ingredients which are normally ingredients that people have in the house um, and I've just like the nearest shop is a 45 minute walk away from me and I don't have a car so things have been getting pretty ready steady cook in that kitchen last night it was a can of baked beans with some uh, brown rice and a parsley garnish um, but anyway this sauce is going to be your savior and I'm just eating it way too much. Where it's basically just, if you look online, it's on the New York Times website. This is like my main comfort food since lockdown. It's a can of tomatoes, one onion, and then so much butter, like a hideous amount of butter. And that's all it is. And then you cook it for about an hour and then you have the most perfect, like comforting, delicious tomato sauce. 
that you can put on anything. So that's been my first big comfort of lockdown. Um, I've also, God, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm sorry. I have I have been listening to Desert Island Discs. I've been roaring through that archive. And uh, there's actually something very comforting about during this time of isolation, listening to people imagining what life would be like on a desert island and isolated. Um, and I'm discovering lots of great new music through that as well. So my top my top choices for Desert Island Discs, if you're new to the archive, are Lynn Barber is a great episode. Carl Jurassi is a great episode. Um, he's the man who invented the pill, amongst lots of other things. Um, so we should all be very thankful to him. Um, who else do I love? Kathy Burke is brilliant. Uh, and Dawn French will make you sob. So that's what I've been listening to. And I'm I'm going to type. Someone was just in my ear. I was going to pretend like someone wasn't in my ear, but uh, it actually felt sort of glam, like I was a presenter on the Big Breakfast. Big Breakfast, Jesus, <laughs> really showing my age there. Um, we are. I'm going to talk about um, books that have given me comfort um, because I'm away from my bookshelves. I can't dip into the old faithfuls. So the two books that I always go to when I'm feeling sad are oh, three actually. One Day by David Nichols, just because it is the most perfect love story of all time. Uh, Heartburn by Nora Ephron, because it's just so full of reassurance and humanity and um, great, great humor um, and just gorgeous writing. And then uh, there's a book called Delight by J.B. Priestley that I adore. Uh, and he wrote that after the Second World War to try and lift national spirits. And it's a list of all the things that bring him delight, everything from, you know, fresh tobacco to getting the giggles around the dinner table. And uh, it's just really, really, you know, uplifting. So that's a fab book. But what I'm actually going to read you is something I've been reading a lot. Uh, it's <laughs> The Love Letters of Dylan Thomas. And uh, the reason I think I'm so drawn to them is I'm feeling a bit of a lack of passion in my life right now. I'm not going to lie, guys. I think <laughs> I think most single people are. Um, and you can't get any more passionate than these quite drunken love letters uh, to the many loves of Dylan Thomas, including his wife. So this is a letter that he wrote to Caitlin. Write to me soon, very, very soon. And tell me you really mean the things you said about you loving me too. If you don't, I shall cut my throat or go to the pictures. Now I'm sad. I'm sad as hell. And I'll have to go to a pub by myself and sit in the corner and mope. I'm going to mope about you. And then I'm going to have a bath. And I'm going to mope about you in the bath. Damn all this anyway. I only want to tell you all the time over and over again that I love you. And that I'm sad because you, you're got, you've gone away. And that I'm not going to lose you. And that I'm going to see you soon and that I want us to get married once we can, and that you said yes, you wanted to too. And write to me when you get this, or before you do, only write and tell me all there is to tell me. And I'll write to you when I'll be in London, and then we'll meet however much they try to stop us, and then I'll be happy again, and I'll try to make you happy by not being a half-wit. All my love for as long as forever and ever is Dylan. <sighs> Lush. Right, I think it's time for some questions, isn't it? So if you uh, send your questions in, I don't know if I'm using the right lingo here. I think you send them in, comment, send them in. Uh, I'll be answering them for you and I'll try to keep my head visible. How are you finding the difference between the noise level of a city and where you are now? God, it's so nuts. It's, um, I'm, I really, really am in the middle of nowhere here. Um, I've got just I'm on the beach so I've just got the sea in front of me and fields behind me I'm incredibly lucky to be here and I've got one person in like a one mile radius who's my 89 year old uh neighbor Brian who's currently reading everything I know about love which um makes me a bit nervous I got a knock on my uh, kitchen window the other day uh, and he was asking me if it was true I really did go to Leamington Spa when I was drunk um and sadly, I had to say yes, Brian. The answer is I do. Um, so it's so quiet, and it's so 
I'm so unobserved here, which I'm just not used to. I've just grown up with kind of urban neuroses about keeping noise down and you know, always locking every door and definitely not walking around naked. And I can say that wholeheartedly I have thrown all those neuroses out the window since I've been in Devon. And uh, I'm just relishing the silence. Um, it's, it, I'm cautious, I don't want to sound too smug because I know that there are lots of people who would really love to have some silence and some nature around them at the moment. It's a very lucky accident that I ended up being surrounded um, by, by such quiet. Um, but it's made me do some quite nutty things. Like I basically talk to myself all day now. And also something quite weird I've noticed that I do. I noticed it yesterday on a walk. I very rarely, I'll see probably one person on a walk and I'm always plugged into music. Um, so I've just started singing, just big operatic singing as I walk. Just like, must look insane. Yes, bring in a question, please. This is exactly why my career as a big breakfast presenter never took off. Do you have any tips for how to be a good friend in lockdown when you can't see people? Um, do you know, I think the thing is, that's my neighbor, Brian. Hi, Brian. Just knocking on my window. Um, how to be a good friend. I, um, do you know, I think the key thing is, is that it's cutting each other some slack. Um, because everyone on some level at the moment, no matter what their circumstances are, is having a bit of a rubbish time. Um, and I think it's really important that every time we speak to the people that we love, that we take into account not only the fact that they should be accommodating our pain and our stress and our anxieties, that we should be accommodating theirs and and just to try and allow for as much like madness as possible. Now is the time to just dig deep and just like do those deep yoga breaths when your friend is being a bit of a nightmare. And I'm, I'm sure my friends have to do this to me as well. And just like really, really go to the very, the very depths of your compassion um, because we need it as much we need to get, we owe each other as much as we can at the moment to just be as patient and as kind as possible and to try not to be irritable. Um, and also like do a Zoom. I know they're annoying. They're so annoying. I fucking dread the Zooms. But the minute that you see that lovely face of someone that you know and love, um, you just feel so much more connected to them, even if it's even if it's just five minutes. Or if you just can't bear Zoom, then just speak on the phone. But just don't try and not have an entire relationship on WhatsApp because I think that there be monsters. Next queue. I'll be five minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Just leave it there. That would be great. Thank you. Brian's got my ring light. There we go. Every twist and turn of this story you're getting. Okay, as someone also isolating alone, are you feeling the skin hunger sensation that I and other solo isolators am currently feeling? Uh, yeah, that's why I'm reading Dylan Thomas love letters every night and that's why there was like a pool of drool left on my pillowcase after I watched normal people. Um, yeah, it's rough, so rough. I saw a tweet the other day from, from a woman who said it's now been over two months since somebody touched me um and that is it's it's really difficult it's um it's a thing that humans need and crave and it can make you i think the thing that's difficult about being single at this time is it really can send you into a, a place of despair about you know would anyone really care if anything you know you can go into very kind of catastrophizing ideas when you're when you feel alone and you can get very kind of distorted ideas about how much people do kind of care about you and think about you um what i will say is yes it is hard being single in isolation um yes it can feel very lonely do you know what else is really really hard being married in isolation. And do you know what else is even fucking harder? Being married with toddlers in isolation. All of it is hard for everyone. 
this is just going to be rough for all of us. So everyone has their kind of their the upside of whatever situation they find themselves in. You know, people with families, they do get maybe more of a sense of routine and more of a sense of a community and more of a sense of purpose and like they're needed. Um, but they also don't get quiet and they also don't get to work out the shape of their day. And they also don't get to, you know, drink a whole bottle of Jacob's Creek wine on a Wednesday evening and then dance to Pendulum for an hour, which I may or may not have done last night. So just try and see the kind of silver linings of whatever situation you find yourself in, because trust me, whatever the other thing is, that, that would be really, really difficult as well at the moment. Dolly, I can relate to everything you write. How do you get the tone so on point? Oh, Lucy, I love you, that's so nice. I shouldn't really, I should have pretended not to see that one because I, I once heard that in radio, like one of the, the biggest faux pas is uh, being someone who, being a DJ who reads out the praise before they read the listener question. Um, so I should maybe have just skipped past this one, Lucy, but this is such a lovely, um, such a lovely question. I'm so glad that you relate to the things that I write about. Um, you know, it, I, I never try to, when I sit down to write, I never cynically sit down to think, how can I relate to as many people as possible? How can I represent as many people as possible? How can I, you know, I, I never I never go out, uh, I never seek, seek that out. So um, when that does happen, it's just really, really nice. And uh, it's like the greatest privilege of being a writer is feeling like you're connecting to people and feeling like um, stuff you're saying is resonating with them and truly it's something I'm incredibly grateful for so thank you very much for saying that go on have another compliment then okay as someone who grew up in Edgware how did you find it growing up in Stanmore so um Edgware that's uh, about a mile and a half from where I grew up end of the northern line oh my god this is so boring I'm uh, sounding like a dad at a barbecue um I I'm yeah, it's difficult I found growing up in the suburbs like an incredibly uh boring and infuriating thing but equally I obviously must say that I also had central heating and my own bedroom and you know we were in a fairly quiet cul-de-sac that's like an incredibly lucky uh place to find yourself growing up in um but you know i did i think the thing that i always felt with being in stanmore and i've read lots and lots of writers who who grew up in the suburbs have said this and actually what i've realized since i wrote the book because i fucking blither on about the suburbs so much like it's this extraordinarily unique experience uh growing up there but what I've realized is the British suburbs kind of is, is such a universal experience, really, wherever you are in Britain. It's, you know, the houses are modest. Uh, the restaurants are all Italian chain restaurants. There's nothing to do when you're a teenager other than drink Bacardi Breezer and WKD in car parks. And that, you know, and the buses are slow. That It's the same for everyone. Um, and... I think the thing I found frustrating is I felt like I was in the margin of the excitement. I was in the margin of the city. Uh, I remember reading Billy Crystal, who's an amazing actor, say that when he grew up in Long Island, he would look out on Manhattan and it would be like Oz and he just needed to get to the epicenter. And that's definitely how I used to feel. Um, but, you know, I think there's also a lot to be said for being very, very bored when you're a teenager, you know, a lot of very, 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 very sad little diaries got wrote. Uh, a lot of very, very shit poetry that doesn't really rhyme or scan. A lot of daydreaming, a lot of imagining, a lot of hoping. Um, and that's really what you should be doing when you're a teenager, I think. I think you shouldn't really be that stimulated when you're a teenager. You certainly shouldn't be cool and you certainly shouldn't be hanging out in cool places in London. So uh, actually now I'm quite grateful that I had that time of being just incredibly bored. How lucky for that to have been my adolescence to have just been bored in a cul-de-sac. 
right this is our we're doing two more questions is there one book that you wish you'd written um that's such i mean look i'm going to be totally honest i am so jealous of so many writers which is just so pathetic because the whole point of writing is everyone gets kind of only that person could ever write that story um and i really do believe in the idea that, of like great genius and great ideas and great creativity kind of collaborate with the right creator um and that's like a like a mystical thing that happens between a creative person and a project and you can't get jealous of that because that's just not your that's not your love story to barge in on or or say i could do that better um it's like such a unique experience for every writer i think unique to them and how they write and how they see the world all that being said uh pretty pissed off that i didn't write animals by emma jane unsworth um which is like a kind of female with male and i about flaneurism uh in manchester uh, between two women in their early 30s and it's just it's just so good it's just like got such great pace and it's filthy and so fun and it was the first book i read i read it in my mid-20s that really made me reassess how we um tell women's stories when it comes to transgression and hedonism and uh it's just like so energizing that book i find and it really kind of altered the way i think about things so all that sort of hippie dippy stuff that i said yeah still pretty annoyed at emma jane unsworth because i would have loved to have written animals well done emma right final question do you find writing fiction or non-fiction easier um so have just finished writing my first fiction and i have found it creatively more challenging and emotionally much easier so when you're writing non-fiction you feel incredibly uh, um, open and uh, you have to be and you have to to write good nonfiction you have to to quote um, Diana Athill you have to kind of examine the indecent truths about yourself so you know constantly looking at the way that the ways that you might have messed up or the things that are contradictory about yourself or um, where things went wrong that's like just not really a pleasant experience to have to revisit that every day when you're writing nonfiction um, about yourself. Um, but you don't need to plot it so much. So it's easier, I suppose, structurally, but it kind of takes it out of you much more. Um, whereas a novel, you, there's, I feel much safer when I write fiction. Um, and there's something that feels now like such a luxury of being able to uh escape into another world into other heads and other characters that aren't me um and that's gorgeous and just much calmer writing this novel was just like the most calming experience i wasn't i was so much less stressed than when i wrote my memoir but it's a lot of old work the old novel um i can't bash that one out i didn't bash out the memoir but you can't you've got to do a lot of planning and you've got to do a lot of kind of structural thinking um and thematic thinking, you've got to think about plot as well as story, um, what you're saying and what you're telling. So it's much it's much more complex, I found the process, um, technically writing a novel. Thank you so much for joining me in my sort of home. I'm so sorry for all the toing and froing and the frozen screen and um hopefully it gave a bit of an avant-garde edge uh next week you will be joined your penguin at home will be with ruby wax and i'm so jealous well i'm going to tune in and watch it ruby wax is uh just one of the greats she's got one of the best desert island discs episodes actually and her memoir is brilliant i always remember in her memoir she talks about the women who were dressed the fashion of the 60s that they all looked like spinal cords in a mini skirt just perfect writing um so thank you very much I'm trying to think of all the things i have to tell you i have to tell you to uh follow me on twitter and instagram at dolly orbiton i'll be totally honest i wouldn't do that right now i'm a bit of a nightmare on twitter at the moment i'd give yourself a break i'd maybe rejoin me uh once lockdown is over and i'm not tweeting so relentlessly like a 
such a show off all the live long day. Um, but if you do follow me on tw Twitter, I would say the witching hour is about eight o'clock and that's when I'm on my third glass of white wine and I'm sort of limbering up my fingers on the keyboard about to tweet something really, really stupid that I'm going to heavily regret the next morning. And maybe it might even delete actually. Um, so that's where you can find me. Um, Comfort read to remind you, you should be reading if you need some comfort. Delight by J.B. Priestley, Heartburn by Nora Ephron, One Day by David Nichols. And if you need a bit of passion, the love letters of Dylan Thomas. Thank you so much, guys. Hope that wasn't too shambolic. Happy reading. Mwah.